The very first version of Futurity, there was actually two steam brains. There was my, my drum set, the band in the very first version, it was at the Zipper Factory, a great, great New York City venue that's now closed. Um, the band was up in, in a, a loft. Um, so the band was not really on stage proper. And I had started to sort of collect um, a bunch of different kinds of objects that were generating certain sounds that Cesar seemed to sort of be asking for in his compositions um, that my traditional drum set didn't quite have. Um, he started sort of coming up with ideas for, for beats that I just, I was like, man, I just got the snare drum and the bass drum and can't do it. Um, so I started going to junk shops and looking for alternative kinds of um, materials. Um, and for this first version, I had collected them um, really sort of considering their sonic properties, how they sounded for the, for the, the music. Hadn't really thought about how it looked. Um, in this first version, I was up on a loft with the rest of the band, and we had this sort of visual representation of the steam brain on the stage. So those things were separate. The visual and the sonic were, were totally separate. Um, and after that first version, we were like, wait a minute, why don't we just make the drum set be the steam brain? That seems like the most logical thing. Um, and this, um, th thinking about history, this was eight, almost eight years ago. So that's like how long we've been working on this piece. Um, so when it started out, was it as big as it is now? No way. <laughs> <laughs> um, when it started out, it was like, it was a really, um, I mean, the visual thing that, that we had, which uh, it was like, you know, it was like this big. It was like this big and there was like a shower curtain. It was pretty lame. Um, how many pieces does it have now? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, many. I, I don't know. I couldn't count 20. It's like probably 20 different moving, moving things. And then there's a lot of sort of more decorative elements. Um, and as far as uh, your background goes, are you more of a musician or an artist? Because this has a very sculptural quality to it. You know, this, act, this project was really my, my first, um, first uh, you know, experiment in, in making anything visual. Um, that, that, that moment of like, which um, we should credit your daughter for thinking of it. Um, <laughs> um, that, that, uh, that moment um, uh, of, of sort of uh, making the leap from, from it just being a sort of sonic thing that I'm responsible to uh, towards, towards it being both sonic and visual and having to sort of take on both of those roles. That was the first time that I really started building something. Um, so I don't really have a history and I, you know, I never went to like art school. I don't have a history in sculpture. Um, I'm in art school now. Um, getting, my, getting my MFA at the Bard, Bard College. Um, so the theatrical process is highly collaborative by its nature. Yeah. And so, um, do you have designs for this or plans for this? Or how do you communicate with the uh, other members of the theater uh, when you want to put it into the stage, on the stage? And that sort of thing? For sure. Yeah, it's actually pretty tricky. I don't draw. I'm like really bad at, it, it's really actually hard to communicate my ideas because I'm, um, I'm, I'm not uh, trained in, in, like, um, in, in making shop drawings or, or anything like that. Um, I'm terrible at drawing. Um, and so a lot of the way that we communicated was, um, was through pictures and, and videos. Um, and then we had this really great retreat. We had, um, oh, my dad's here. Um, we had, that's my dad. Um, he, he was, <laughs> he's like the brain of the steam brain. He's the he, he was, he was generous enough to go on vacation and, and let me, um, clear out his garage and we moved all of this stuff into his garage um, in August. And it was there for a month. And um, at a certain point we had like a retreat where like the whole design team came, stayed at his house, thanks dad. And, um, and, we, and we, like, we worked on where, where all this stuff ought to be located, how the composition should work. I had most of these elements sort of conceived um, like individually or a lot of them. Um, and then it was just a real collaborative um, way of generating the composition, um, generating new ideas that I wouldn't have thought on, of on my own. Um, and, um, and, and then, yeah, I mean, the, 
that process is, is wonderful. I, I, I'm like so grateful for it because I had so many ideas that I was like holding on to with my with dear, dear life that I was so proud of and sure of. And when you get six other people to look at those ideas and they're all like, mm, I don't know if that's really the move. Um, and you're still holding on to the thing, um, but you listen to them anyway. And then the next day you're like, oh yeah, of course they were right. And you know, it's 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 such a it's such a different way of, of making art um, when you have so many different minds looking at the thing. So you're a, primarily a percussionist, and this yet has a very visual aspect. So when you think about looking at things, how do you integrate how something looks? Like there's a cool are those film canvases or something, and, and and you have to be concerned with the sound. So how do you how do you what's your process for integrating those two things when you go to find a piece? Um, it usually happens by way of luck and magic. Um, it usually happens that like the thing that the thing that sounds good often looks pretty cool. Um, a lot of times that's not the case, but um, but a lot of times there's this like yeah, things just sort of come together in this really interesting way. I, I, what I'm, what really blows my mind is that. Um, is that all of this stuff was, was manufactured in America, as far as I know. Um, and what's, what's interesting uh, to me, and which I think connects back to the piece itself, is that um, we, in the 19th century, like if you look at the, the history of, of, of machines, um, there was a, a real big push to standardize things, um, to standardize things to our US customary measurement. Um, and to make things like inter interchangeable so that if something broke down, you, you don't have to contact the manufacturer, or you don't have to like, you know, it, it, things are sort of readily available. Um, and so that, that became, that, that's sort of like how we were able to access a lot of this, you know, older, um, these older pieces, like that big gray wheel there is like probably 1890s or something. Um, I was able to, find a shaft that fits it because it's, it was cut to an inch and a half and you know that's like a standard it's a hundred years old more than a hundred years old but the inch and a half is still good <laughs> in the 21st century which is, is amazing so um, so uh, yeah a lot of and, and I also uh, off of that I mean I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in thinking about Julian's character and, and how he's, he's this cog in the machine fighting fighting in the war um, totally a, a sort of like replaceable cog. If he, if he goes down, there's another soldier there mm -hmm. to, to pick up his slack. Um, and, and just thinking about the sort of that, that, uh, that step in technological evolution of, of interchangeability in these components mm -hmm. and, um, and thinking about making that leap to, um, to applying imagination towards, towards making something that isn't just sort of replaceable and um, and a cog in a machine making redundant work, but actually doing something that's important and, and progressing. Yeah, so, you know, uh, um, Woody Guthrie put this machine kills fascist on his guitar. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what would you put on yours? This machine kills futurist? Or <laughs> what, would, what would be the no. noun there? Um, um, this machine breeds in independent thinking. Um, creative thinking. I, 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 my hope, and 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 from like the from the people who I've gotten to talk to after these shows, especially um, people in high school who are like really excited um, in in seeing something like this that like they can identify things that they're familiar with that like that come together in a way that wasn't expected or wasn't intended at the outset of the design of these things to create something like sort of visually uh, compelling. Um, uh, I feel like it it, bre it breathes that kind of imagination and that kind of. Um, there there was somebody the other night who said it reminds me of DJ. That was the coolest thing I've ever heard because he was like, yeah, it's like you take a little bit of this and a little bit of this and and like these two songs aren't meant to go together. Mm -hmm. They're not even at the same tempo, mm -hmm. but we found a way to like to make a mashup. To mashup. Yeah, and then you have like a technological mashup here. Yeah, nineteenth century pieces, mm -hmm. and in the twenty first century, really. So you just going to skip the twentieth century. But um, no, there. Yeah. Well, we've got the the Schwinn bike from the eighties. Yeah, my dad had one of those in the basement. My dad had one of those too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
have never made such great music. But, um, <laughs> um, so um, if you could take the Steam Brain, well, actually, let me back up for a second. I um, it's, it, this this has been in other places, like you mentioned, the Zipper Theater, and it's gone through its own evolution. Mm -hmm. But could you just take this and put it in a bigger theater, or would it be a completely different thing if it went into a bigger theater? In other words, is there a unique quality to it right now that's almost the same as a live performance in the person who's performing, and that, that performance only exists in a moment in time, so this machine does just exist in a moment in time? Like, right now, is this a special thing we're looking at? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 if we were to move this show into another space, we have to build a new steam brain. I mean, I think that we've learned a lot from building this, and it would probably be um, along, you know, I mean, I feel like we've got, part of, part of the issue is like, how do you get 11 people up there and, you know, finding their, their own space to operate it, and that's its own sort of part of the composition. Mm -hmm. So if we were in a larger space or a different space, all those things would have to be sort of considered, of course. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, I like the analogy of like of, of it of it being a sort of I mean that that's what theater is it's this sort of like unique moment mm -hmm. where the audience and the people on stage get to sort of share this experience that's that's fleeting and disappearing. So in a way, it's like a live instrument. It's like it's alive now. It's alive, and, and then it won't be when the run is over. Sure, I mean it's going to go into storage, <laughs> and, and, uh, that, and then it may never look like that again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't expect it. I don't I don't expect that any. Just like every show is different, which is kind of the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and are you going to document its present state? You in, should. In, in any way? <laughs> we should get, we should get on that. draw it or... I'm um, not going to draw it. So, but you're good at drawing. I right? could draw it. Well, we did, might take a little more time than we have right now. Maybe but. not in front of all of these people, <laughs> yeah. but you could draw it. Um, I'm a terrible drawer, and I'm also bad at photography. But if anybody is good at th those two things... Well, because I, I think, you know, it, it's such a beautiful thing to, to document it. Mm. It would be a wonderful thing. You know, and you could sell prints and things. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about the legality of all this. Uh, isn't it yours? <laughs> Where are those crickets? <laughs> well, I mean, the group or the theater mm. or something or somebody. For sure, um, yeah. So if you, if you imagine it being somewhere else, is there another story of any of all the stories in the world, known and not known yet, that you would want to apply the steam brain to? Um... It seems pretty tailor-made. <laughs> it seems like a good fit. I mean, I guess the only thing I could say to that is um, I always sort of feel like this show isn't actually about the Civil War. It's, it's about war generally, but it's also just sort of about human imagination and human fallibility and, and things that are bigger than just this particular story. Oh, yeah, to me, the, the yeah. show seems to be very much about the present moment, where we have this great faith in technology that we're right. going to solve all of our problems. Really. Right. This is just a different way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, how did it get its name? <laughs> Cesar knew it. Was it. A song before it, was a it was a song before it was a thing. Right. Yeah, it was a song. And can you tell me a little bit about the um, poem that opens the second half? Your little... I didn't write it. Cesar wrote it. Um, but um, it, it, am I correct in remembering there's a little bit of a pun at the end where the rhyme should be great, but you say good? He, he that was Eric's change. Yeah. So <laughs> good is great, and he just he, we tried it both ways. Uh -huh. Good and always funny. Forever. Good was yeah, always yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's very good. Um, so, do you um, uh, have any plans for what might be next for the Steam Brain? Uh, for the steam brain in particular, yep. um, or no, I don't. I mean, we don't. We don't know anything about. Can I it. say something about your question about Which what one? the people. I just feel like what's interesting about Eric is that the steam brain is for futurity, but what is going on to many other pieces is Eric's approach to percussion as storytelling, and Eric has such a specific relationship. With That is going on in many other, and you can see Eric working on other projects and doing a similar kind of creative process to totally different effect. So that, I mean, that's to me so interesting. Like, Steam Rain is one of their creative creations. That's what I want to, that's what I want to say, sorry. Now tell us about your other crazy creations. A lot of them are with Cesar. Um, Cesar has um, 
has a couple other musicals that he's working on that we've gotten to collaborate together with. Um, and then um, I'm also I'm, I'm pursuing an MFA at Bard, and that's actually taken me more into the realm of sculpture, which is really exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm working on just sort of like freestanding uh, sculptural pieces that, um, that I hope are sort of um, places, for, uh, places for reflection, places for thinking. Mm -hmm. um, about material and uh, about the body. And so when, when you're playing the steam vein, I'm, I'm anything but a percussionist, is there, is, it's a very physical act. How much thinking is going on when you're doing it? Or is it muscle memory or, is it, or are you thinking in that moment? It's crazy. Sometimes I'm like, man, did I leave the stove on? Or like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like all those little things like pop up into your head. What does your stove look like? <laughs> Does it have um, a lot of extra parts? It has a lot of extra parts in it, yeah. <laughs> and they all have a certain resonance. They're all just moving around, yeah. yeah. Um, it's all, uh, it's funny that some of the, some of the like the, the, the opening scene to Pee Wee's Big Adventure, if anybody's familiar, was like a big, it was like a big childhood thing for me. I was like, oh God, I love that. Like all these things moving around. Or like the opening scene to, uh, to uh, Back to the Future. There's a lot of movies that are like, um, and, and those are the things, those are like the seeds that were planted as a, as a kid that like, mm -hmm. I think um, w when I started to build this, I was like, oh yeah, this feels right. This is the thing that I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. And now it's like I get to show up every day and go inside of there and, and do it. It's really kind of magical for me. Is there a part of it that's your favorite part? Um, I like the squid. The squid is kind of my favorite. The squid in the bottom should I show, should yeah, I show yeah. you the squid? Say there's anything in besides uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure in your childhood that mm. contributed to making this? Mm. 
Yeah, you know, it's, I guess I was like, um, there was a moment in my childhood where like I was like, I had all these troll dolls. You guys remember troll dolls? And like, I like, I got my hands on a, on a box of matches and I started like setting them on fire and then like taking off of, like kind of meticulously taking their limbs off. I know. But, but, and then, but then, and, and, and initially, initially it was kind of a destructive act. It was like, I'm going to destroy these troll dolls because I hate them. And I was like burning their hair and stuff. But then like, I like started to put them back together. And that was actually this really big moment because I was like, oh, I don't have to just burn these things or like mutilate these things. I can like make something new that is not, was not intended by troll incorporated, <laughs> you know? Um, and that was really empowering because I was like, I'm not at the mercy of, um, like I loved puzzles when I was a kid, but um, I always like felt like once you finished it, you were kind of like, oh, like I knew what it was gonna look like because it looked like that on the box. <laughs> and then it's just sort of like a letdown. But what I loved doing was like going to the diner with my family and like building these sugar castle, sugar packet castles, you remember? <laughs> and and um, because there was no there was no like rules there was no you know and so I don't know I found the troll doll thing to be kind of liberating once I realized like oh I can create whatever I want just by burning the ends of these and like sticking them back together. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> So do you, do you fabricate this whole thing yourself or do you outsource it to other people? Or you? It, was all, um, it was all sort of uh, piecemeal. I mean, I, I worked on so much of it, um, again, in my dad's garage um, and in, in my basement um, in Brooklyn. Um, I've never had a shop, although now I'm looking for a shop, which I'm really excited about. I think it's time. Um, I think I've outgrown my house, but um, it's... Um, and then we've had a lot of help along the way. We got stuck a bunch of times in this process and we reached out to a, a whole host of people who um, lent their uh, advice, um, professional shop uh, uh, um, prop builders and, and stuff like that. And um, we had, uh, my brother's friend came who like builds his own bikes. And he helped uh, us figure out some of the problems with the Schwinn. So that was cool. Um, yeah. And in, in this process, um, how, how do you see the role of failure? Mm. I, I love failure. Um, I think it's really important. I think that um, I've failed so many times. I think we all have. And I think it's like, um, it's so hard to get back up, but it's the thing that like makes, the thing, makes it better. Because if you, don't, if, if, you don't, if you don't fail and it doesn't hurt really badly, then you weren't, you weren't, try, you weren't trying to do something that was grand enough that it, you know, you weren't trying to fly high enough um, for it to hurt so much. Um, so it's just an indicator that you were, that you have lofty um, ambitions and that you should learn from your failures and like keep rolling. Um, yeah. Is and, there yeah. a specific case where either there was a failure or um, someone actually got injured playing it? Oh. It looks like the thing you could easily lose a finger if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, there was a there was a, a moment where a, where something where that big red wheel, which weighs about 50 pounds, fell onto my drum set uh, during tech, um, and that was just an indicator that we needed to spend a little more time figuring out how to mount it. Uh -huh. It's either bolts and, or something. Um, yeah. yeah. Things break all the time. Things break all the time. We have a we have a section in our uh, in our um, performance note report for that and it's often occupied with like um, this thing isn't working and you know and then you know so there was like there were a few there were a few shows where that giant wheel didn't work uh, there were a few shows where the legs didn't work um, oh yeah the leg just like fell yeah I mean you know they're you know it, this is a professional operation <laughs> but you know it's like when you use things like this every day um, and um, you know, there's just wear and tear, and, and there it's old stuff. You know, um, when you think about putting, you, you mentioned that the genesis of it comes from you know trying to create sounds that you had in your mind, sort of, and creating the machine for it. But what's the background for the rhythms and your musical background, integrating with you know various 
rhythms that you, you bring into it. Yeah. Um, I, I went to jazz school, which I don't recommend for anybody. Um, but... Um, Did you go for percussion? Yeah, I was a jazz percussion... Talk about, talk about preparing you for the real world. Um, uh, but um, I'm actually super grateful because I learned all of this, you know, I, lear I learned a lot of like um, really old uh, Afro-Cuban rhythms and, um, and a, lot of, um, a lot of that stuff is just sort of buried deep in my bones. I, 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 I sort of stopped accessing it for a moment and, and it just sort of like decayed a little bit. My knowledge of it decayed a little bit. Um, and but every once in a while I can sort of access it it's deep in, in my bones and so it, it comes through um, in, in I think the right way um, Cesar said something to me once about Cesar is a also a jazz school um, for uh, the saxophone and um, now he plays the acoustic guitar um, and he said something about how the acoustic guitar was his second instrument um, which I always think about, like the, 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 the acoustic guitar allowed him to sort of avoid all of the trauma um, that jazz school brought on his relationship to the saxophone um, while still allowing him to play music. And I feel something similar uh, in, in my relationship to the drum set and, and my way of sort of trying to pervert the traditional drum set. Um, by sort of adding to it or mutilating it or, or doing whatever uh, I can to sort well, this of... This seems like a very radical drum set. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, the, um, in the hit, if you look at the history of drum sets, um, you know, there's a, there's a term trap kit, T-R-A-P, and it stands for contraptions. Uh, the, the, the drummer, like, you know, this is like early jazz history, but the drummer was the, the person in the band that would end up with all the sort of remaining stuff, like the stuff that wasn't, wasn't a trumpet, wasn't a saxophone, wasn't the voice, wasn't a piano, it was just sort of the extra stuff, whatever it's going to be, a woodblock, a cowbell, you know, a sewing machine, like, you know, what, whatever, whatever, whatever the extra stuff is, and I, I, I like sort of thinking about, you know, expanding, um, they used to have, a, they would have a, a trap table, a, a little table for all their little miscellaneous stuff. I like sort of thinking about this could be the future. This is like the big the, table. Yeah, the big ta next drum kit for <laughs> indie rock musician. I, I I think it's a good idea. I like it. Um, should we open it up to uh, any questions from the sure. audience? Sure. Yeah. Um, anybody, has any questions? anybody have any questions? Uh, something they're curious about? Yes. Um, in your wider pop music experience, do you see a trend of um, other musicians looking towards found objects? Um. I think, you know, with the advent of electronics, it kind of opens up a whole um, wide realm of where any sound can actually be kind of created and found. And, and so I can't think of anyone specifically doing that, but it's certainly happening. Yeah. I feel like to some extent I'm, I'm, I'm working against the, the, the phenomenon of samples. Mm. Because, you know, it's like... Um, a lot of times people will just bring a laptop and a hard drive to a show mm -hmm. and they've got zillions of sounds on there that they can tweak all sorts of ways. Um, but yeah. that all fits in their backpack. And, cool. and for me, I'm like actually really excited about the fact that it's like one sound for one object and I've got to carry it to the gig. And, but, and I think this is really important because I've never heard of a recorded performance of a percussion instrument that comes anywhere close to the sound of the actual in the thing room. hitting this, yeah. you know, something being hit. Yeah. You know, that's, so it's really key. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, good. Uh, thank you for coming. And, thank you. Uh, tell your friends. Uh, the future of America depends on seeing this show. So.